Thanks for joining us here at Faith. We hope that you're encouraged and challenged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about Faith, our campus locations, and how you can stay connected, check out faithishere.org right after this video. Welcome this morning. Hey, good to see everybody here today. Take your Bibles out. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in our series of Land of Not Enough. And this is kind of our theme verse that we've been sharing every week. So let's stand together and uh, get right into it. Amen. You guys look awesome today. Hope you had a good week and it's about to get better. Amen. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse number 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Wow, isn't that a great, great line? Whatever it is, his grace is there. And my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I what? Delight in insults and weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Father, we love you so much. We are so thankful for your amazing grace. We're so thankful for that ever-present help, even with our weaknesses and frailties. God, you're so good, so loving, merciful, gracious. We thank you. We thank you for your sweet presence that's in the house today. And I believe there's going to be a, a yoke-breaking anointing that will be in this place today, that men's lives will be changed, transformed by the power of your word. And we love you, God, and I need your help. We ask in your mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We've been in this series in the land of not enough, and, and we've been dealing with a tension of we know that God has a destiny for us. We know that God has a purpose for our lives, but sometimes we just feel so inadequate. Like, God, how can you use me? You got the wrong guy, the wrong person. You surely can't use me. And we feel weak. We feel insufficient. We feel like we can't get the job done. And so we begin looking at some biblical characters that feel the very same way we do quite often. And the first one we looked at was a man by the name of Jacob. And the message with Jacob is get rid of the labels, all those labels that the world puts on you, that the enemy puts on you, that we have put on ourselves. It's time to get rid of it and uh, quit wrestling with God, fighting and just receive the blessing that God has for us. And Jacob has changed from Jacob, deceiver, to Israel, one who has power with God. And then the next week we looked at a man by the name of Gideon who is hiding in a wine press for fear of his life. And so the message there was get rid of our fear and move into the calling that God has for you. And he became a mighty general and was greatly used by God to bring deliverance for the nation of Israel. Last week we looked at Moses and Jason brought the word here. Jason did an awesome job again bringing the message of God on Moses. And he, he stuttered he says, I'm not enough. You can't possibly use me. But, but, the, but God spoke to him from the bush and said, who made your mouth? Who's talking to you? 
We sang the song, Show Me Your Glory, about let this place be burning, holy ground that we live and walk in. That, that's an allusion to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. And he says, I want you to know that you're insufficient, but the I am God, Yahweh, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will go with you, and I will be with you. And so what an amazing message and, and, and illustration last week. This week, we're going to look at a lady by the name of Hannah. Hannah lived in this land of not enough, and, it, and Hannah's story is she's in that land not of her own doing. It's nothing she did, it's nowhere she messed up, it's nothing she brought on herself. The Bible says she was simply barren. And if you were barren in that day and age, it was just an incredible curse that you felt was on your life. You felt like you couldn't produce what God had made you for, and that was to give birth and have children, and you cannot do that. And so she is in that place of barrenness. And, she, and, and you get to the point where when things happen to you and come against you, it's not of your own doing. The tendency for us to say is, that's unfair. It's not right. It's not fair to me, it's not, it's not fair at all. And so we, we feel that way at times, and so we're gonna look at Hannah's story in just a moment. First Samuel chapter one, turn there if you would. First Samuel chapter one and verse number one. We feel like because of my current situation, because of what I'm going through. God doesn't care about what I'm facing. God doesn't understand. God doesn't know, or, or, or in some cases, God may be even against me. Because God, you brought this on and you allowed this thing to happen and we look at our good shepherd and we know theologically that God is good. He's just good to everybody else but not to me. And we have those times when that good shepherd leads us through the valley of the shadow of death and it's in those times we can't see and we don't understand and we're on this journey and we say, why am I going through all this stuff? And listen, if you're not there now, you're gonna be there at some point in your life. We go through those valleys and those times because he leads us through the valley of the shadow of death to get us up to higher mountains and and higher places with him And, and so we're taken through those trials and tests and we say, God, that's not fair. So we're going to look at a lady who was experiencing this very same thing. So I'm reading from 1 Samuel chapter 1, and I'll begin with verse number 1. And there was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zephite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tuhu, Tohu, the son of Zuf. Don't read this too fast. <laughs> An Ephraimite. He had two wives, one was called Hannah, and the other was Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were the priest of the Lord. Whenever they, the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of his meat to his wife Peninnah and to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Wow. The Lord had closed her womb. If if anybody had reason to say life's not fair, it would have been Hannah. God did this thing to me. God caused this to happen. And and there's several reasons she probably came to the conclusion life's not fair. And the first is simply this, the comparison that's going on. And so right away we read in the the book, in the Bible in verse number two that Peninnah had sons and daughters, had all kinds of kids, lots of kids, and, and Hannah has none. And so she keeps looking over at her other wife, and, and, and I, don't know, I don't know what's going on with Elkanah, why he would have two wives. I, I can barely handle one, and uh, I can't hardly do that very well. And so to think about having two wives, I mean, that's, that's a mess to begin with, but it already sets themselves up for comparison. They're, they're, they're competing for their husband's affection, and uh, there's all these comparisons that are going on, and it just simply says, Hannah had none. Now listen, in that culture, if you did not have kids or children, it, you did not have validity or value or purpose to your life because that's what a lady in that culture was good for, giving her husband sons. And this other wife has many sons and many daughters as well. And so because she has no children, in her mind she has no value. 
The word barren means no fruit. So she's not having any fruit. So she is empty and she is broken. And when it's all said and done, she comes up with the conclusion, life's not fair. And so there's this whole comparison that is set up in the word of God. And then the second reason it doesn't help at all when verse number six says your rival was provoking you. And it says, and because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. My bad enough to lose, but when you're, the rival team is talking trash, when the rival team is strutting their stuff, right? When the rival team is rubbing your nose in it, it, it makes it all the harder for us to handle. It's bad enough that I'm barren, but don't make fun of me and don't mock me and, and don't provoke me and even come against me. Look at verse number seven. It continued. This went on year after year. Every time Penina has a, another son or another daughter, that's number nine, I can't help it. Just one fertile lady, and Elkin is quite the lover, and here we got more kids, you know, and, and, and none. Got none. And so she keeps on provoking her. Look at where it gets to. and what it Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. So now her hurt turns to grief because that's how far the provoking has taken her. And she belittles her and her hurt gets worse and worse and worse. The third thing that probably was the hardest to take and the reason she really felt life was unfair is because God did this to her. God, God did this. Bible says, and God closed her womb. So God, it's your fault. You're the creator of the universe, and yet you allowed me to remain barren. It's bad. We have this expression, God is good all the time. So when they're saying that, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good, Hannah just keeps her mouth shut because God may be good to everybody else in the room, but God's not good to me because he's made me barren. And you feel the sting and you feel the hurt. If God is so good, why has he closed my womb? Life's not fair because when it gets right down to it, she even lacks understanding by those closest to her. Look down at verse number eight. It says there, and Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? And look at this line. Don't, don't you just love this line? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Uh, man, let me give you a clue. Just, there are times, just keep your mouth shut. Just, just don't say anything. Because as soon as you open your mouth, you're gonna stick your foot in your mouth. And, uh, and that, that's exactly what happens with Elkanah here. You know, he does what a lot of men do. When you see your wife cry, you fall apart, right? Because you don't know what to do. And we're thinking, I'm the man, and I have no emotions, and I'm very stoic, and I got this wife who's blubbering and crying and won't eat and has fallen apart, and, and we just don't know what to do. So men think they want to fix it. And so we fix it by giving advice or by, by saying something. And in this case, most of the time, our attempts are really futile and really stupid when all our wife really wants to do is hold them and love them and listen to them. And we are so quick to try to fix it and, and, and are trying to fix it, usually we make matters worse. I can just say, baby, baby, you got me. You got me. What else do you need in life? You got, wow. And she cries, oh, she cries all the worse. Doesn't, doesn't help. <laughs> And then, and then the fifth thing, that real quick, that, that, that she comes to the conclusion life's unfair is found in verse number 14. And, and even the religious leaders start judging her. So instead of bringing consolation, instead of bringing encouragement, instead of praying and believing in faith with her, they judge her. And so it says in verse 14, uh, and he said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. And so we'll talk about her prayer life in a moment, but, but you have this scene, Hannah's praying and crying out to God, and her lips are moving, and she's really earnest and crying, and, and the priest starts judging her. 
He sees her and says, you're an alcoholic, you're drunk, what are you doing here, you know? What are you doing in the temple, coming in here like this after you've been drunk? And so he judges her, and that just adds to her pain and heartache and, and this whole thing. So she's misunderstood by her husband, she's misunderstood by Eli, and she's provoked by her rival wife. And you get this whole scenario going on. Listen to me, people are gonna come into this church, and they come from every kind of background, every kind of lifestyle, every kind of walk and journey, they don't need to be judged. They're already hurting, they're already messed up, they're coming looking for help, and so our first response should always be with grace and love and welcomeness and openness, and we're here, and whatever you need, we're here, and we're gonna love on you, and God cares about you, and, and, and we, we approach with that kind of action, and we let God deal with all the issues, but I wanna tell you, when we start judging people as a church, they will not wanna come in, they won't find help here, and they'll just turn and go out the other way, unchanged and uncared for, just feeling more condemned and more beat down. I like what it says in the Word of God. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world, and that's our mission. And so we save them by showing the grace and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so she is judged. So what do you do when life's unfair? What do you do when we're barren? Some of you guys feel like you're barren on the job and it's just the same routine day after day and you hate your job and you hate your work but you can't quit and you feel strapped down and, and it's just a, the boss is all over you and it's a mess there and every day it's a grind and you're just barren. Some of your marriages are barren. You may be living in the same house, but it's cold, it's perfunctory, it's, it's, uh, it's just going through the motions, and you're, you're, you're alienated, and you're separated, and there's no conversation, there's no laughing, there's no joy, you just tolerate each other, and you make it through, and there, there's some of you in here, you're bearing your finances, and it's week to week, and you're just trying to get enough to make it, you, you're balancing your bills, and you're trying to see which ones to pay, and which ones to hold, and you're bearing your finances. Some of you are just bearing spiritually and you're dry, and you just don't feel the presence of God, and it's not like it used to be, and you, you come in and you go through the motions, but you just feel so empty on the inside, and there's this spiritual barrenness in the curve. What, what do we do when we're barren, and what do we do when life seems so unfair? I wanna give you two things. If you wanna take your outlines, you can follow along this morning. The first one, and you gotta get this. Stop comparing. Let's all say that together. Stop comparing. Don't compare yourself with each other. It only adds, to the, it adds fuel to the fire. It's like pouring gasoline on a fire. It only makes matters worse. It only amplifies your own barrenness. If you're hurt and then you go into comparison, it's like just dominoes begin to fall down one right after the other, and the grief goes to hurt, and the hurt goes to bitterness, and it just progresses because we are comparing ourselves among ourselves. And here's the comparison we make. We, we use this kind of language, that's unfair. We say it's unfair because I'm looking at from my lens and my point of view and so everything around me seems unfair. And the word unfair literally means to have no equality with. And so we see the other person and they've got more stuff and they have, looks like more fun and it looks like they have a happier marriage and they have wonderful, beautiful kids and, 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 and they seem like they got their life all together and why is my life so messed up? And we just compare ourselves with one another. We view fairness or equality from a human viewpoint. And this is where it becomes dangerous because when we start comparing, what you're really doing is looking at the, your, the lens through your own eyes and from your own point of view. But, but here's the way God sees it. God has every one of us on different journeys and different seasons in our life. And so the season God has you in or the journey God has you on is going to be different than the person sitting next to you or across the aisle from you because he has us at different places in our life. And we've got to understand that. Right? Not only that, but God gives different gifts and talents severally as he will, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so the Bible says everybody has gifts, gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to them for their work and purpose, for their mission to be fulfilled, but they're all different, and he gives it as much as he wills and how he wills, but it's so God can use you where he's placed you, so don't compare your gift to someone else's gift. But I've got some hard news for you. God gives some people five talents, and some two, and some one talent. 
Don't say, I'm just a one talent, no good. Man, this guy, he's got five talents everywhere he turns, man. It just, it just turns to gold, and, and I got one talent. And so, no, God has given you what you need to do the job that God has called you to do. Don't begin to compare yourself with one another. It'll mess you up. It, 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 it robs you of contentment. Comparison is absolutely the death of contentment. The moment we start comparing, it only adds to the hurt, and we begin to say, I am less than. And so we live out of that phrase, I am less than, and when you're living out of the phrase of I am left than, less than, it's hard to see God do anything good, because God will bless you, he'll do good stuff, he'll take care of you, you won't even notice it. Why? Because you're less than the person you're comparing yourself to. And it blinds you to the goodness and provision that God has for you. Mm. My radar is up, and so if any blessing comes, uh, I see it from my own narrow vantage point. And because I'm already less than and I'm already behind, we miss all that God is trying to do in our lives. We all have those feelings of hurt and pain and heartache and they are very real and we all have that need for encouragement and there are times when life does seem unfair when the desired outcome i want i'm still barren i don't have any children right now but when we compare ourselves you can never ever be content in any state you find yourself in the apostle paul says i've learned the secret of contentment what in any state i find myself in So whether I abound or whether I'm abased, whether I have much or whether I have little, regardless of whatever condition I'm going through at the time, I find my contentment because his contentment was in the Lord. You compare yourself with one another, you will come to the conclusion life is unfair. You won't get it. When I compare, I can't be content. It's hard to trust the goodness of God when you're comparing yourself to those who are around you. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, 12. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. It's not wise to compare yourselves among one another. Comparison is the thief that will rob you of everyday blessings that help you to see God's bigger picture. You will be jaded, you'll be harsh, you'll be angry, you'll be frustrated because you live in that land of comparison. You get stuck in that land, not enough. So the first thing to do, stop comparing. Stop comparing. And the pain that Hannah was feeling was made worse by the provoking and the many children that Penina had. Now, the second thing is start trusting. Stop comparing, start trusting. Now, it's hard to trust, listen to me, when you can't see God and you can't hear from God and you can't feel his presence or when you begin to think God did this to me and so what happens is it's hard to trust God in those times but I want to tell you it's in those times cry out to God because God does care he does love you he does hear every prayer he is with you he will never leave you nor forsake you every promise is yea and amen and so it's in those times uh, we need to trust in God all the more not get angry and turn away from the Lord trust God. Now, how do we trust in the Lord? I want to give you three things very quickly. Number one, trust God in your prayer life. You take it to the Lord in prayer. That's how we show our trust that God is in control. Uh, Look, if you were at verse number 12, let's look at Hannah again. And she kept on praying to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long will you keep getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. See that language. Pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of great anguish and grief. 
You see her pressing in? Her barrenness would not keep her from God. And so she's pressing in. She's praying fervently, fervently, earnestly, seeking God out. The Bible says, out, pouring out my soul to the Lord. James chapter 5, 16 says it this way. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Effectual, fervent prayer. You know, it is so easy for us to go through the ritual of prayer, right? We're supposed to pray. Come to church, we tell you every week to pray. We go home, we try to pray. And if we're not careful, we get in this habit of just repeating words. And before you know it, we prayed for 20 minutes. We have no idea what we just said, no idea what we've just done. We're, 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 not, we're not communicating anything because we're just repeating words. The Bible calls it vain repetition. And so we go through this vain repetition. We say the right things. We try to, and, and, and yet you don't see that Hannah fervently pours out her soul to the Lord. We're praying. If we're not paying attention to what we're saying, I don't think God's hearing it either. Doesn't mean a thing. Fervently praying, seeking God, waiting on the Lord. And then it says in verse 12, and it says she kept on praying. She prayed persistently. So she prays fervently, she prays persistently, and she keeps on praying. Listen, don't stop praying. When you feel like life's unfair, that's not the time to give up and chunk it all in and quit on God and get hurt and angry and leave the church. That's the time to press in and keep on praying. How many have left the church during situations that seem out of their control or someone said something about me or did something to me and it's not the time to leave, it's time to keep on praying, right? Press through. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says it this way, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And what? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What a promise from God's word. Prayer and petition. Although you may feel God is far off, he is not. And prayer is that pipeline of our communication with the Lord. And it's those times we need to pray persistently and we keep on praying and we don't let go and we believe and we hang on to the promises of God. You can cast your cares on him because the Bible says he cares for you. You can present every need to him. And he says in his word, he'll give you a peace. We read in our text at the beginning, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And so I pray and I keep on praying and I won't stop. Wow. Another way you show your trust in God is trust in the sovereignty of God. There is a time when we get step back and say, God, you know what? I may not understand what is going on around me, but you are sovereign, you are Lord, and I believe you are in control of my life. And so we trust in the sovereignty of God. I, I, I like what it says in verses 18 and 19. Look at it. And she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. She went her way and ate something. Her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. And Elkanah lay with his, Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Now, now look at that. She worshiped the Lord before she conceived. We pray earnestly, we pray fervently, we never stop praying, but there comes a time when we begin to say, God, I'm giving it to you, it's in your hands, and she does something powerful, she moves from praying to worshiping. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? God, I'm gonna worship you, I'm gonna praise you. If I have a kid, great. If I don't, great. You are still God, you are Lord, and I'll love you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. The word worship literally means to bow down. It's not just talking about a, a physical act of bowing down, although that you can do that when you worship the Lord, but it's talking more about bowing down my will to what? The sovereign will of Almighty God. 
And so the outcome may not, may not be what I wanted or desired or, or, or looked for, but yet, God, you are still sovereign, and I will trust, and I will worship you and believe in you. Mm. Sovereignty of God. God is in control. Paul would say, uh, I read at the beginning, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Why would, he, why would he say he delights in those things? Why? Because God was doing something inside of Paul. He was working out his good pleasure in him, and he wound up saying, when I'm weak, when I'm poured out, when I'm going through all this, God, then I realize your strength in an amazing way. Trust God even in the seasons of difficulty, and seasons of difficulty will come. Turn to James chapter one. James chapter one. Look at verse number two. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Even in tests and trials and difficulties, I will what? Still worship the Lord. Why? Because even in those times, God is working inside of me. He's developing perseverance. He's building my faith. he's, He's making me complete and mature, not lacking anything. And so I may not understand my barrenness. I may not understand what is happening to me, yet God is still sovereign. And I can trust that God, even in those seasons, is working something in me. Isn't that awesome? We, uh, there's a verse we like to quote. You all know it well. It's Romans 8, 28. And we do so good quoting it when things are going great. But when things are going wrong, we don't want to hear that verse. And it says, and we know that in all things, everybody say in all things, In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God, in all things, you're doing a work inside of me. If the miracle doesn't happen the way I want it to, I trust that God is still working and God is sovereign and I will worship him. And ultimately, eternity will reveal all the goodness of God worship. Start with prayer. Worship, I think, is, the, is probably one of the ultimate expressions of trust. When you can worship God in the hard times, in the difficult times, if you can get your hands up and say, God, I love you, and you're awesome, and I don't understand it, but I will worship you. When you can do that, it is a great expression of trust. So you show trust when you pray and you take your needs to God. You so show trust when you move into that place of worship, but you also show trust in sacrifice. I want you to continue. Look at down at verse number 26, and to me this is absolutely amazing. Verse 26 it says, and she said to him, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And there it is again. And we worship the Lord there. I want you to think about this. Hannah, follow me here, gave back to God the very thing she wanted the most. You don't think that was a sacrifice? To to have the joy of your son. You got a son. You got what you wanted. She has a son, and and, and she's she's been barren. She's been praying for him for all her life, and and she's thinking about she's going to raise him now. She's going to watch him play. She's going to watch him grow up to be a young man. When she gets old, she'll have someone to take care of her. What does she do? She pays the ultimate sacrifice and gives him away. You talk about trust in God. In his plan, in his, the name Samuel literally means because I have asked of the Lord. So the thing she asked of the Lord and she got back, she wound up giving back to God. Amen. Hannah's attitude shows the power of sacrifice. Give me what I don't have and I'll give it back to you to what? Be a blessing to the nations. She saw the bigger picture. She saw the kingdom picture. 
Our attitude is, God, everything I have is yours. Everything I own, everything I hope to be, my life, my family, it's all yours. I, I give it back to you. When we say, Jesus Christ, be my Lord, literally means, God, you're the Lord of every aspect of my life. You know, we, we, we said earlier, we give, cast all our cares upon him, we give him our hurts, we give him our pain, we give him our, our mess, we give all that to the Lord, we freely want to release that, but we go beyond that, we also give him our finances and my answered prayers and my blessing and my kids and my house. We say, God, it's all yours. That's what he says in Romans 12, 1. Therefore, in view of all God's mercies, present your bodies, give your lives, give yourself back as a living sacrifice holy pleasing to God which is your spiritual act of worship God is my source of every good and perfect gift I realize that everything I have ultimately comes from him so therefore all the worship and all the credit and all the giving and all the praise goes back up to him I give it back to the Lord when this is your attitude, then he lifts you up out of the land of not enough. He lifts up your countenance. When you let go of that which you love the most and you give it back to God, something will happen. It will flood your life with so much joy and so much peace because you know you're doing what God wants you to do in your life. You give it back to him. When you give God your best, give God your first. Give God that which you love and treasure the most. You become a recipient of an amazing joy. You say, where do you get that? Look at chapter two and verse one. It says, my heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. Now, right after she gives Samuel away, what does she say? This is the best day of my life. My heart rejoices in the Lord. The joy flooded back, came back, because she gave her best back to God. And notice what it says here. There's a phrase, my horn is lifted high. Anytime you see the word horn in the word of God, it doesn't mean she had horns. It means power and authority. Horns always denote in the word of God, when you see prophetically the beast with seven horns or ten horns or whatever it is, it always denotes power and authority. So God, you fill me with joy, and but you have given me authority and power. How would she do that? She would do that through her offspring, Samuel, because Samuel would be a mighty prophet and a mighty priest used by God. Look at what Samuel would do. Samuel would unite the nation of Israel. In the book of Judges, they are all divided. They're all, all of Israel's divided, and, and they're in a mess, and there's judges all throughout the nation of Israel. Samuel unites the entire nation of Israel, right? Not only that, he restores the priesthood because Eli was a bad priest. His sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were bad priests. They were the priests, they were the heir parents. But God, through Samuel, is going to restore the holy spiritual life and priesthood back to the nation of Israel. And let me take it a step further. Not only that, but Samuel's the one who would anoint King Saul first, but eventually anoint King David, who is Jesus Christ. He is of the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the offspring of David. He is our eternal king who will reign forever and ever and ever. His horn, her horn, is lifted high through Samuel because Samuel's going to have a greater impact than could ever be known if she had kept Samuel all to herself. Are you getting this? When we give our best back to God, he takes it, he multiplies it, he uses it to bless the kingdom of God. Israel is changed because of one man that she says, God, I trust you so much. I'm giving them back to you. You use them. Use them. However you see fit, use them to bless the nations. And God gets all the glory because now we have a restored, redeemed Israel.